was here the last time. If you remember, Professor Nyongo, we were traveling in portholes. We were we had lot of portholes in the city. And uh, Prof, now I see that uh, the city is clean. The city is it's beautiful, really. I mean, when people talk about development, I don't know whether they expect that one day something will drop from the skies, bop, and then that is development. No, what we are seeing today is what is actually development. And we are, um, we are, I'm totally thrilled and impressed with what we have seen here in, uh, in Kisumu. Uh, what you have done is absolutely impressive. And uh, there will, you will never come a time when nobody is going to complain. You know, so the fact that one or two people might complain, it should not distress you or put you down. That will never end. Ata Yesu, alikuja hapa kutuokoa. Na walifanya nini wananchi? Eh? Wariu? Hivo, hivo, alimfaja, ata zizi viongozi. Tusije tukakufa mwoyo, kwa sababu kuna wakati nyingine wale tunasavu. Wa, wa, wa oni ile inafanyika kwa sababu vile vile iko na shida mingi katika nchi yetu ya Kenya Kisumu is not the only one with problems I can tell you for sure you have better roads than we have in Nyeri what I have seen here and you know unfortunately for me when I'm told something by Governor Nyongo I have very little that I can oppose for many reasons first he was my professor in school so he has been my teacher you know, I have, sat, uh, yeah, I have sat taking notes when he is teaching. And you know, you always feel very intimidated by your teachers. He appealed, I am serving in a ministry, in a ministry of health, where he was also minister for health. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, hello, that's a nice one there. Uh, uh, hello, viewers, welcome to KDL TV Live, as you see that play over there. Welcome to KDL TV Live. We are coming live from Minneapolis, Minnesota, a uh, continuation of a conversation around uh, connecting with the diasporans. Today, we are honored and absolutely privileged to, ha to start, start a good conversation with Professor Enya Nyongo, uh, Governor of Kisumu in Western Kenya, uh, who is going to Take us through a conversation on what he and the people of Kisumu and in Kenya are doing uh, during this COVID-19 and, and how we can partner with diasporans to make sure that we develop both parts of the world that is in Africa and here in the United States. So good to see you, Mashmiwa. How are you? Fine, my brother. How are you? Very good. L let me start before I even st we start the conversation. Let me say first of all, from my very end, my absolute respect for you. As a young man watching you at the university, uh, a great person, your, your struggle for the democratization process in Kenya and Africa, I salute you for that. Your work in academia, I salute you for that. And, and the fact that you, you've decided to be um, on our show today, I totally appreciate that. So please accept that uh, as, a, as a good word of uh, appreciation for the good work you're doing for our country and our people. So, so before we start the conversation, let me, let's talk about what's happening in the world today, and that is the, the coronavirus. Here in the United States, I think as you've read in the news, uh, we are pretty much caged in at home. The coronavirus has changed the way we do things, not individually, but uh, also business-wide and even in academia, and uh, really changed the way even societies and countries around the world do things. Let's start from you as a person. How are you dealing with this uh, coronavirus and professionally as a governor of that prestigious city or county of Kisumu. How are you dealing with it? Well, you know, as you yourself have, have, have observed, coronavirus took the world by storm, you know. Although it hasn't had as much drastic effect and uh, tragedies in Africa as that done elsewhere, like in the U.S. and other temperate climates, Yet the little it has done has completely changed people's perspective to life in general. One, uh, that it is an infection that you, you don't expect and you don't know when it will hit you because it comes through the air, through breathing and so on. And this is the first time in my life actually that I've come across such a, a ferocious infection. We know that TB can be, be spread through the air, but TB attacks people very selectively. I think the vulnerable people, people who are unfortunate enough to get TB, are not as many as those we are seeing with coronavirus. First of all, 
the figures we see from our Ministry of Health, those who have been infected before we get those people have recovered, is itself staggering because you begin to think, what about if those who are infected all perished? What, where would we be today? Therefore, I mean, when it came, uh, both the national and the county government said, let us take the most drastic steps possible, uh, expecting the worst scenario of this COVID-19. And so let it not find that so unprepared that it completely ravages our population. So a lot of panic was uh, gripped with the uh, leaders. Uh, we did our best to, to prepare for the worst. Fortunately, the worst has not come, which means that now those steps we had taken of preventing it, of uh, having better sanitation, better hygiene, like washing hands, you know, strengthening our health systems, we can all preserve them uh, for the future. We can now improve our healthcare system much better than before, because we, before we were kind of complacent. We knew what we were dealing with other time, malaria, HIV, AIDS, cancer and so on but now we must be able to have a resilient health system for any eventuality i think that's the biggest lesson that we have we have learned the other one is how covid 19 has affected the other parts of life for example you just take for granted that people can just congregate anywhere anyhow and expect the best out of it no we say a little bit of discipline in society a discipline of making sure that in schools for example water is available kids are clean we don't use pit latrines to the extent that they can spread all kinds of diarrhea diseases and so on. I think if we learn this lesson and institutionalize these changes, uh, there would have been a silver lining on COVID-19, i.e. we come out with better practices of sanitation, of hygiene, of general health, of preventive health care, or public health care, and also making sure that the public health care and preventive health care is not just in the health system, but in society in general. No, uh, thousands of and uh, uh, thousands and thousands of Kenyans across the United States and <coughs> and many other countries around the world, obviously, are watching with very keen interest on what's happening in Kenya and other parts of the world. And so, to hear that from from you is quite encouraging. In fact, that you've been Minister for Health before, I think that's quite encouraging. And just to make, on behalf of KDLTV, also emphasize that uh, coronavirus is real, it's problematic, and it can cost lives. So for those ones watching here in the United States and those ones watching in Africa or in Kenya, we want to make sure that uh, please take, pre take precaution uh, because we don't want to have anybody uh, lose a life because of this. And I think uh, as we continue the conversation, we'll get into the details of how we can as a people move forward. So, Professor, le le let's get to, to you and, and focus on what's happening in Kisumu. And I, 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 I'm a great follower of what you do. And here's what you said before you got to uh, become a governor of Kisumu. You said, quote unquote, Kisumu is a county of great potential, but a disappointing underachiever. Those were your words before you became governor. Later, as governor, you said, Kisumu is a great county of great potential and a promising achiever. That, that, that's interesting. That's a good development there. But again, in the clip we played moments ago, a lot of people who've been to Kisumu, including my friends who are in Kisumu right now and who are watching, do acknowledge the fact that you've really done well. At least Kisumu is doing pretty good. So the question for you, how have you been able to achieve this within such a short period? One essentially by motivating people. You know, people are the key element in any process of economic and social change. People must believe in themselves. They must believe it can be done. You remember what Julius Nyerere once said in Tanzania, something which became a song? Malimu Kasema, it can be done. Play you a part. I mean, if it can be done and everybody plays their part, however humble a role is, then things can happen. I'll tell you the secret behind cleanliness in Kisumu. We just employed ordinary young people and women gave them the requisite uh, tools to keep the city clean, had a leadership of that tool, that, that the, the, this team that, that was committed to what it was doing. We have our own ministers and our own uh, civil service, you know, talking about the importance of cleanliness and keeping the city in order. We also had a goal, we said, by the time we have our facilities in, in Kisumu, 
2021, the Africa Cities uh, Summit in November 2021, everybody who comes here should go away and say, yes, there's a city on Lake Victoria in the Republic of Kenya in Eastern Africa worth remembering. And that motivated people, and we started working. At the same time, we used our resources very, very discreetly and very effectively. We had a program here called the Kisumu Urban Project, which was meant to build infrastructure in the city and uh, was a grant from the Kenyan government through a loan by the Agence France de Développement. And we worked very hard to make sure that this program that had been dormant for about five years, we used it effectively within a very short time. And I think using other resources too from the World Bank, the Kenya Urban Support Program, which gives support to urban centers and urban areas in Kenya, that these are resources that if we use effectively and, uh, and, and efficiently, we, we can change our city. You don't need much. You only need good planning, good resource use, and a motivated population, and you get there. Finally, even the secret behind coronavirus not spreading in Kisumu, I sat down with my very indomitable county commissioner, Madam Susan Waweru, and we said, look, we have been told that this coronavirus is with us. And we have been told that it's worse enemies of the, the, the environment in which it breeds most is where people are congregating in large numbers and don't take care of hygiene. And we discovered that there are two areas in Kisumu where that is a reality. At the bus park, where people come from all over Kenya and all over East Africa and congregate there, very congested, not very clean. And at Kibuye Market, which you know is one of the biggest markets in Sahara, Sahara and Africa, people come from all over East Africa there. It was also not very clean. And we said, look, we must decongest these places and clean them up. It was not an easy exercise. There was a lot of resistance, but we did it. And thereby, we stopped the two major centers of possible coronavirus reproduction and, and, and spread that really helped this city. The rest of the cleaning exercises followed. And I think that in the end, people in Kisumu have been very cooperative and very, very forward looking. They are willing to make sacrifices today for tomorrow's gains. And I think that's what we must continue doing. And I think we'll get there. Obviously, again, there, there, there are Kenyans in the diaspora, not necessarily residents of uh, Kisumu County who are watching and they really want to invest in Kenya and they want serious engagement. That's what I'm hearing and, and keep texting me here. But in the meantime, those ones who are viewing, I see text messaging coming here. If you want to ask the professor a question, feel free to go to our Facebook page on KDL TV. Post your question there. The professor will have one, two, three minutes to answer the questions later. And we're being streamed live on Twitter and YouTube. So if you have any question, please pause there. Our technical guys will get the question for the professor later. So, professor, there are many people who want to really invest in Kenya and, and more so in Kisumu. Uh, there are people interested in investing in Nairobi, in, in, in Mombasa, and other parts of the country, but, but more specifically in Kisumu. And I also have many non-Kenyans or friends of Kenya who want to come and invest in, in Kisumu. Here's a chance for you. If they are to come and invest in Kisumu, w w what three areas do you think that you would rather have them come and invest? Well, you know, Kisumu stands at a time when it has offers the greatest opportunity for investment. Investment in real estate, investment in the hotel industry, investment in leisure, investment of uh, water sports on the lake and investments in uh, infrastructure uh there are in infrastructure i would say two things one solar power we need to power our streets using solar power and not power from the east kenya power lighting company because Power from Kenya Power and Lighting is damn expensive, my brother. We are struggling to pay it, but were we to establish here our own solar plant, we will get plenty of sun, and uh, light our streets using solar power, light our hospitals and, uh, and institutions using solar power, and we would cut our electricity bill by about 80%, I tell you. And we are looking for that investment desperately. Secondly, in the real estate, we have already improved infrastructure in Kisumu, as I've told you. It's a healthy environment to invest in. And we have a government structure and, um, and, and, and uh, e-commerce and e-governance in the city. And we have, uh, we have established the Kisumu 
the Social and Economic Council, composed of in, internationally known people, including the former chairman of Bank State Bank of Mauritius, and former finance minister is a member and other personalities, and they are there to help us in, in as people can give us transaction ad, ad, advice. Uh, and so we have a, we have the infrastructure to deal with and handle major investments in Kisumu already. Now, when you come to real estate, one of the things that we have launched here is uh, urban renewal. You know, our whole old estates, as it were, you know, the living areas like Makasembo, Ondiek, uh, Anderson, and so on, the, 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 the houses are, are, are per se, they are old, they are small, they are sitting on valuable land but offering very little value themselves. If we had a more efficient use of that land by, through urban renewal, having five-story apartments rather than these single bungalows thinking of one-eighth of an acre is not very good economics. So we, we, we have started uh, talking to, engaging with many companies and so on to do this. And very soon we are going to be groundbreaking for our first uh, urban renewal affordable housing program and others will follow. So this is the time to come. On the lake, we are we have formed what we call the Lake Lakefront Development Corporation, which is chaired by the former Auditor General, Mr. Edward Uko. The Lakefront Development Corporation is soon building a 46 kilometer uh, promenade uh, on the lake uh, on which only, you know, people who walk or ride bicycles will be allowed. And that opens the space around the lake for building hotels, uh, marinas, and so on on the lake. Because of the lake is virgin. We don't have such investments in the leisure and, 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 and hospitality industry. And we have appropriate laws uh, to engage our investors, both local and foreign. And I'm afraid that if our own people don't respond quickly and, if, and, and promptly, uh, these opportunities may be taken by foreign investment because we are not going to discriminate between one investment or the other. What we have is investment in an atmosphere that is friendly to the investor and that encourages fair profit and productivity. On the hill of Riyadh, now that we have completed the spatial and the physical planning of Kisumu and the, the, the documents are going to be published soon, We'll have proper infrastructure on Riyadh Hill so that it doesn't grow as a jungle or a kind of high-sounding slum. Okay. Uh, we want slums that have existed here in the informal sector to be per se too. We have engaged in a program with the World Bank called Kenya Informal Sector Support Program which is going, giving us resources to build infrastructure in the informal settlements and therefore to attract good development in terms of housing and other commercial ventures. What we are helping out in, in the final analysis is not the old type of real estate, but what we call integrated settlements. So that if you have a housing program in a place like Anderson or, 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 or Makasemba and so on, you don't need to walk downtown to go to a supermarket. There must be the integration of commercial facilities with residential facilities. This is the consumer of the future to which we are inviting you to come and invest. Okay. Good. good. I, I, I appreciate that. Great work, obviously, going there in, in, in Kisumu. Here's the concern for most diasporians, whether those ones in the U.S. or other parts of the world, and I've seen this sometimes a lack of clear communication with uh, um, most account governments I in Kenya. I've seen quite a number of governors and, and, and MCAs come to the Uni United States, but most of the time there's no clear uh, journal of communication. So there are many diasporans who want to really invest in Kisumu, but they really don't know exactly who they should got, get in contact with. Yes, we do know you are the governor of Kisumu, but beyond that, a lot of people do not know. And I've seen some other counties across the country, they have had what they're calling the diaspora liaisons, the people who are connecting with the diasporans. In Kisumu, do you have somebody in particular 
or is there an office or a desk that really works on diaspora affairs so that we in the diaspora can get directly in contact with that person and be able to help. Point being, and, and I think this is where we, we miss the point, the point, point being that, yes, we have an ambassador in the United States somewhere in Washington, but in truth, here in the U.S., there are over 150,000 Kenyan ambassadors. Every single Kenyan in the U.S. really is an ambassador because they work very hard and they want to invest home. So do you have somebody who is in charge of the diaspora affairs in your office, and how do we get in touch with that person? Well, I think that's a very good question, and, and, and you're right, you're right. The mistake really has been ours, I must say, of not making it very clear to people in diaspora where is the contact point. Okay, in Kisumu, we have what we call the special delivery unit, which, are, which has a director and, 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 um, and a fixed address. So anybody who would like to invest, you can go to our website, and contact the special delivery unit, uh, just a direct a special delivery unit, Kisumu County, or you can write, write directly to to contact directly to the, the the various departments which deal with various aspects of investments like industry and energy will handle those. But at least that's the center that you need to contact is a special delivery unit. I think. We are going to make it much better, really, to elaborate our own website uh, so that there are clear instructions, the clear guidelines. I think that has been our failure, that, that really we, we have not made it easier for our diaspora, bro diaspora brothers and sisters to have a very clear entree point where you can send questions and receive responses that indeed I accept is, 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 our, is our shortcomings. We just assumed that if somebody goes to our website, you get the information, but it's not always that easy. I think when you are wooing people for investments, you need to do much better than that. And I think the point you, are, uh, you made me aware of, I think I'll, I'll definitely do, do, you know, institute that. And so if you need to, to, to get information, that send your email to Info at kisumu.go.ke. Uh, Kisumu in capital letters, but info in small letters, I do suppose. Um, info at kisumu.go.ke. Again, I repeat, info at kisumu.go.ke. And then you'll get a response. And email these days work very fast, really. If, if the person receives the email, is a disciplined person who knows that people need answers. I do, I do tend to reply my emails very properly myself at five in the morning, but <clears throat> I hope that's a practice that everybody should adopt. Yes, uh, that would be good. If they respond very quick, we, we, you know, as long as it's not African time response, that would be good. So, Professor, if, I think mm. it would be unfair if we move beyond this topic, if we don't talk about what's coming soon or uh, next year in Kisumu, and we're talking about the yeah. African Cities Convention in Kisumu. And that, that, that's great when we hear that, you know, thousands and thousands of investors are uh, converging soon in Kisumu. Uh, that's great news, and I'm hoping that uh, the rest of the, the, the counties in Kenya are doing the same. Do you mind taking a minute and uh, talk about that before we move to another topic? African Cities is um, a gathering or a meeting or a convention of uh, leaders of African local government, subnational government, and municipalities. We realize that we have subnational governments in South Africa, they are called provinces, but perhaps they even have much more power than our counties. We have subnational governments in, in, in Nigeria called states. Again, they, they easily, from what I can see, have much more power, much more resources than our counties. And there are certain places like Uganda where they still have the old colonial type local governments. Again, they have a role that they play in, in, the, in, in the economy and in politics. So what African cities does is that, it, and even traditional leaders like you have in Ghana, like you have even here in Kenya, Nabongo Mumia, and uh, the, the Luo Council of Elders, and Kikuyu Council of Arnold. So African cities uh, brings the opportunity for all these uh, leaders of subnational governments and entities to come together every three years and um, discuss certain issues germane to subnational government, their development, their politics, their cultural uh, 
uh, experiences and so on. Now, uh, this year, while the Secretariat in Morocco, in Rabat, is, is, is still trying to work on the theme for this year's, next year's Afri-Cities, we have proposed to discuss um, what we have proposed to them, something to do infrastructure, climate change challenges, and the future African city. You understand that uh, one of the things that uh, some national governments should do in terms of the cities is to know that there are not those cities or townships, and no one stays standstill. In the next 30 or so years, there will be centers of great conglomeration of people. In fact, it is said by the year, the year 2050, 50% of Africa will be in, in urban areas, in cities. So we, we, one of the challenges that these cities will face is transport, infrastructure. And of course, with climate change, as you have seen, uh, you want to have uh, an environment in cities that can be resilient to the vagaries of climate change. So we were thinking that uh, together with Habitat here in Nairobi, that we can have such a topic and see how we, 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 we discussed that. Now, we, we thought of this topic even before the advent of coronavirus. You know, coronavirus, as, as it has been said, is as a consequence of climate change. Now, such uh, epidemics in where people gather together, like in cities, I mean, can be life-threatening, as you have seen, epidemics. So we think that rather than wait, until we get this crisis, we in Africa should begin discussing this thing much more seriously and preparing for the future. Hence the importance of the cities. Now, what we need to do now in Kisumu, what we are starting to do, of course, this is uh, something that we do together with the national government. The national government really is the, 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 the promoter of, of, of Africa cities at a continental level. We are the host. And simply because I was in uh, Marrakesh at the last Africa cities conference, now over a year ago, we were able with we were we were we were able with uh, C S Eugene Malwa to to sell Kisumu as the next venue for Africa cities. We wanted rather than hold the convention in major cities like it has been done up to today, to hold in the convention on what we call a uh, intermediate city, you know a city like Kisumu, which is still reasonably smaller compared to Johannesburg and, and Cape Town and Nairobi and Lagos, but big enough to hold such a conference. And there are many cities like that in Africa, Entebbe, Mwanza, and we want these cities to have a chance of discussing their problems and seeing what growth in the future will mean for them. Uh, that's the essence of the Africa Cities Convention in 2021 November. This is going to be the ninth Afri Cities Convention. There have been eight before. And in fact, in 2006, uh, the, uh, the, the convention then was held in Nairobi. So this is the second time it's coming to Kenya. Okay, good. good. So good to talk about, about that. L l let's see, again, most, most, most diasporans, obviously, a few questions will come for you from diasporans I I in a minute. But here is, I take a good example of what the Australians do. So the key point with coronavirus, obviously, we have to think and rethink the way we do things. And I'm happy to note that uh, you're really taking those measures. And most governments, including I think the U.S., is, is doing the same. But I do borrow an example of what Australians do. So they have a three-point strategy to dealing with their diasporans. Number one, they emphasize the need for developing their own country so that they don't have to have people leave the country, having invested in their education and all that. But they also have... <laughs> So keep on, uh, Australians emphasize on retaining, making sure that they retain their very best in Australia so that they can go their social and economic spheres. They also have a second part of it where they talk about the return policy. Return policy meaning they do encourage <coughs> Australians to go out of the country, but if they achieve well and they want to come back and invest in Australia, the Australian government does welcome them with incentives. So for example, if there are people in the U.S., or elsewhere around the world who want to come and invest, they can come get some incentives. If there are people who are well-educated professors who want to come back, they can be assured a job and something like that. But also, we also recognize that there are many diasporians, many of us probably have come, just an example here in the U.S., who become American citizens and who do not intend to return home but want to engage. So key point here, I want to focus on engaging, and that's really the subject of the, the discussion about engagement. From your end, how do you intend to engage 
diasporians. And the key question most of us are asking, uh, obviously we, we don't want to talk about uh, politics today, we'll talk that later. What are some of the registrative measures you want to take to make sure that you engage the diasporians? You know, when I was Minister for Planning, actually, and Andrew Mulay was governor of the Central Bank, we initiated this uh, repatriation of, uh, of earnings or repatriation of uh, money from the diasporans to, to Kenya. And we were discussing having a special instrument in which diasporans will find it much easier to send their money and perhaps invest and so on. And, and uh, Andrew, we went a long way with Andrew then, then Andrew left the central bank and eventually also left the ministry. But we, we left that issue to be handled by the, by the Kenya National Social and Economic Council, which, which, which I created while I was in planning. And the Social and Economic Council, NESC as it were, National Economic and Social Council, was supposed to continue with this diaspora problem. I'm not quite sure how far it went. But so far, as far as I know, diasporans have been sending money uh, into Kenya, uh, you know, kind of individual initiatives. And the central bank keep on giving us these figures. For example, just the other day, it was said that notwithstanding COVID-19 since uh, March or something, I can't remember, but at least up to date, beginning with a date like March or April, I can't quite remember when, the diaspora have so far sent 27 billion shillings to Kenya. I don't know whether it was per month or for the period. But nonetheless, the money that Kenya has been getting from the diaspora in terms of uh, repatriation of, of, of money from, from abroad has been substantial. I don't know how much of it for, is from the U.S., but they usually just talk about diaspora in general. Now, I, I don't think that is good enough. I think both the national government and the county governments are failing diasporans. I think the idea we had with Andy Mulay that we should establish some instrument to which the aspirants could invest in maybe at the national government, it can be some kind of special treasury bonds, I don't know. But in the county governments, what we can do is just uh, work with some of the banks here. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, the banks here, we are working with them very closely and see whether they can be a bank, one or two, to which diasporans can send money, which is treated in a, in a, in a, in a special way. And by the way, we, we welcome ideas from diaspora themselves. Let's not be paternalistic. Let's hear what their needs are. For example, if diasporans, and I know they are investing in the real estate market, I know some who have come together and started some projects on the hill in Riyadh. Now, what role do they, do they want the county government to to do because you know in Kenya it, we believe uh, it is practice that government should do as much as little as possible to interfere with the private sector but at least government should create the enabling environment for private sector to prosper uh, and I think it should be uh, a dialogue between diaspora and ourselves what what are the diaspora and Kenyans interested in in terms of investing in the counties particularly Kisumu what is it that they would like, like as an enabling environment to invest? In that en enabling environment, what is the role of county governments? What specifically are they giving the county's uh, government as a charge? That look, we are charging you to do this or requesting you to do this so that the proposal that comes out as establishing an instrument for diaspora investment as creating an enabling environment for diaspora investment is, 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 is a project of both parties, of both diasporans and the county governments. And I think so far, I don't think we have engaged in that kind of discussion. This is the first time we are doing it. And I think there's always a beginning to everything. And if this can be a beginning, I'd be very happy. So, yeah, that, that, that should be really, and obviously we, we are very thankful that you're talking to KDL TV. So, mm -hmm. I, I always had a, a, a slightly different viewpoint about uh, the amount of money that uh, Kenyans abroad send. I think uh, by the number, I think it should be about 6.7% of the GDP. That's the amount of money that Kenyans abroad, uh, abroad send to Kenya, and most of that coming from North America. But I tend to think, n focusing, looking at diasporans, in terms of how much money they send to Kenya, in my view, sometimes it's not a it's fairly narrow view of things. There are a lot of Kenyans that I know, for example, here in the United States, who are in very well-placed positions, 
we have very senior doctors, medical doctors, we are very senior professors, we are very senior <laughs> lawyers, we are very senior people in IT who are doing great work here, we are people who have invested heavily in business and real estate. I think assuming that all they need to do is to send money to Kenya, uh, that's not enough. I think there could be a way in which we partner so that we connect county governments to different associations or organizations here in the United States, and that's how we can best grow. I think it's, imp it's, it's important to, to, to point that out. <laughs> and also, the other point you're talking about, the media uh, professor, the question out for you as we move to the next subtopic, then how important is the, uh, the role of the media, including KDL TV, in making sure that the diasporans connect well with Kenyans? And here's the point. Every time I've seen you here, I see you come here, very humble man, with your nice jacket, go to church every Saturday. I've seen you have nyamachoma and the gideri, which I know is your favorite dish, and that, that's okay. But we've also have had some concerns where we've had a number of, with all due respect, governors come to the United States with a delegation of about 14 plus MCAs, which clearly suggests a waste of public resources. What do you think should be the role of the media in ensuring that we have a good connection between the diasporans and those ones in, in Kenya? Well, you know, the media, the media is a very innovative institution. You really can't tell the media what to do. The media really knows how to mine information, how to create information, uh, and how to generate stories which make a difference. I'll give you an example. When Edgar Snow went to China during the revolution, uh, from 1936 onwards, he used to go and come back. I mean, it was Edgar Snow's ingenuity. I mean, he just went. In the end, Edgar Snow became an institution in the U.S. If you wanted to know anything about China, you turned to Edgar Snow. Uh, and, of course, he made a name for himself. But it also, he also served humanity in that he built a, what, a reservoir of knowledge about China, which, which the U.S. at that point in time held as, a, as a nothing. But when there was an opening in China, uh, after Nixon's visit there, People found that Edna Snow, Edna Snow was mad. Edna Snow was actually investing a lot for America's future. So I would think that th these things cannot be, I, would, I don't think they are always, as far as the world of journalism and information is concerned, there's never any kind of clear, well laid out method and uh, approach and so on. No, it is a, it is a thing to me, uh, is, the, is the, the inquiring mind of the journalist that makes the story original and that that discovers something that people don't know and that begins informing the public or something they were not aware of so uh, i would say i mean uh, in my earlier life as a young man i served briefly as a journalist for the then voice of kenya and, and, and the nation and so on but i i think that uh, mine was a much easier thing i wish be sent to go and see plays and write criticism about that and I was not told how to do it. I mean, I, I just went and saw, and then I went back. What is it in this play that the public would be interested in? What was the message? So I would say that I would use that same approach as far as the, the fourth estate is concerned, that we, like Edgar Snow, there's something called counties. What do you report about it? How would you create some kind of, some kind of, some kind of, you know, what do you call it? Woof! in the U.S. to people to know about counties and go there, you know. And so, so far, this KDR TV uh, has done pretty well. I mean, uh, ben has, Bernard has done a good thing. I mean, we come there, we don't tell Bernard what to do. He follows that and gets these stories and sends that sort of thing. And people marvel, is this where we were? What's happening there? He creates us a, a, a what, an awareness about, about these things. And I think, um, I think that's the way to go. I, I think... We should develop this kind of informal, spontaneous relations, and we should kind of, those of us who engage should be able to create much more trace for you into, in, in, into and it will, it will develop, it will develop over time. And as it develops, it will play some very critical role. So, so good. I, I, I wanna, in, in a few minutes, there are a lot of questions, uh, Mr. Governor, who, who people really want to ask you questions. But before we move and have a short uh, commercial break, I have a question for you that almost everybody is asking. Obviously, you, you, Professor Nyong'o, Governor Nyong'o, that's great. There are three very important women in your life that we're going to talk about here, but I want to focus on one. I know you, you've talked passionately about your mom, and I'm sure she's looking down on you with a, with a sense of pride, like all, all of us do. 
and obviously your wonderful supportive wife who's done a great job. But most people here in the U.S. know you as, as father to actress Rubita. Uh, the, obviously, great work and congratulations. We're very proud of our, your, your daughter, but also a great, a great daughter of our country and our, and our land, Africa. Great to know. So the question people have for you here, now that she's, very, she's got very powerful connections in Hollywood, is there a possibility that she can use her connections? And obviously she's an adult, you can't speak on, on for her. Can she use her connections to develop the movie industry in Kenya or in Kisumu for that matter? Because I know the Nigerians have done very well in that area, but is there a possibility that she can do, do that for Kenya as well? Well, I think there is a possibility, but you know, the, the movie industry is a very competitive industry. I mean, she was fortunate enough that her first debut in, in, in acting in the, in the movie industry was very successful, 12 years a slave, and she got an Oscar. At the first go, that's very rare in the movie industry. But see, once you get an Oscar so early, you're really challenged to, to keep that standard, you know, to, to, to maintain it as an extremely competitive industry. So it's, uh, achieving that is also a big challenge. How do I make sure that I don't lower the standard? How do I make sure that I develop strong, strong relationships, strong identity with the industry and so on? And that was only about a couple of years ago. So my attitude or attitude as a family have been, you know, give the young lady a chance to develop herself first before you begin bothering her. But she's come here. I mean, uh, let's be frank. She's come here, she was very concerned. She came with uh, Sir David Ajay, who, who was the architect who built the, the Afro-American Museum in Washington. They stayed here for three days, met artists, talked to them, very low profile, it was never widely published in the papers. Uh, she saw our the potential of Kisumu, went to the social center, which is an iconic center in this city, and. They told us what we need to do to improve it, to resume its role as a center for arts and culture in Kisumu. And we have done that. Very soon we shall be, we shall be opening it and we we'll, we'll stream, uh, no, stream it. You know, it's called stream or what? <laughs> I'll stream it internationally and of course I'll inform Ben so that you're queued in and you, you can follow the events uh, for opening the, 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 uh, the Kisumu Social Center. And I think so far that is job well done. But she also came and met young people and artists at the Jomo Kenyatta, uh, Kenyatta Conference Center in Nairobi. I remember one afternoon when I was still a senator, um, and she had a good discussion with, with, uh, with the youth. Uh, she went to the Nairobi game park uh, to, to, see, to see the elephants, and uh, the elephant orphanage there, because she's very concerned about protecting the elephants, and she became an ambassador, global ambassador for protection against the elephant. So she's chosen the kind of things she can do at this point in time, which will serve Africa and serve Kenya in, in a modest way, because she's still, uh, although she has achieved a lot, she's still very young in that industry, you must understand. I mean, uh, there are people who have been staying in that industry for 20, 30 years, you know. Uh, and so if you're going to stay longer, you better also, you know, cut your clothes that fits you at a certain time. So uh, my attitude is that, well, let's give us space. Um, uh, there's two aspects to it. There's a family aspect, which we must keep private. There is a public as aspect where she is a captain in, in that area. We keep our own... Uh, safe distance from that and and I'm, I'm i'm happy that kenyans abroad have given a lot of support and she has not disappointed because even acting in films like um, black panther which became the pride of the black people internationally i mean it raised the profile of, of, of black achievement and reminded us that we are not all is not lost as it were in spite of a very racist world and so on uh, African-American people and Africans in general globally uh, and, and black people in general can achieve wonders. The Wakanda is possible. And of course, when uh, Chadwick Boseman died the other day, it was a great tragedy to the world of Wakanda. And we are all still weeping for the loss of Ch Chadwick Boseman. 
So I, I would say that um, as far as we as a family is concerned, I think that uh, we appreciate our contribution to global culture and to the struggle of black people for dignity and recognition. And maybe uh, during this time of Corona, we would only say that uh, we should all keep safe and wait when there can be an opening uh, in the world for the world of art and culture to, to prosper. Because now, Corona is a big threat to the film industry, you know. Uh, and I think that is where we are now. I think if you can pass our appreciation, we are so proud of her. I think what she's doing is great. And, and remembered very well for our key, those echoing words, anybody's dreams are valid. So I hope if she's watching and I hope she watches this, we would love to have her here on the show. There are a lot of people who came to this country for, to achieve the American dream. We want to make sure that she comes here and uh, assure people that uh, everybody's dreams are valid. So hopefully she can accept that invitation at some point. So, and for our viewers, please have all the questions ready on our Facebook page, if you don't mind. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, the professor will answer a couple of your questions before we, we end the session today. So for now, let's enjoy this commercial break. I met with the Minister for Health uh, two days ago. And he had just been to Kisumu, I mean to Western Kenya. And he told me that um, he had never seen such a clean city as Kisumu. No coffee bar in the world. <laughs> <laughs> he had been to several parts of the country, but he was very impressed by what he saw here in Kisumu, which I think is a plus. <laughs> whose breasts have been removed. Today we are here to donate food to cancer patients attending clinic at Jaramogi Oginga Odinga Hospital. Uh, we got support from Roche Kenya Limited to provide foodstuffs worth 4,000 shillings for each patient, for 100 patients. I thought about doing this because, as you know, COVID-19 affects people with underlying conditions and chronic illnesses, such as cancer, more adversely than it affects other members of society. Some are not able to work anymore, and some are not even able to attend clinics. So this is just to boost their morale and to help them uh, through the next few days, even as we look for other ways to continue to support them in a more sustainable way. So we are reaching out to all kinds of partners to support this initiative through the months of September, and October. For this initiative, we, we as Africa Cancer Foundation have come with breast prosthesis for the women whose breasts have been removed, as well as some bras. Good work there in Kisumu. Uh, to Mwishimiwa Odinga and, and First Lady Kisumu. So we, we're going to take a, a few questions here, Professor. I know the time is running uh, so that uh, people can really get to what you're saying. So I just received one question here, and the first question before we get the word on the screen, and this is coming from Professor Kef Otiso. He's based in, uh, in Ohio. He's talking about a potential research grant that has, has, has been granted, and this is a, is a water research, quality research grant that will be available in 2021. He and his team are wondering how you're protecting the quality of water in Lake Kisumu. Victoria. Oh, sorry, Lake Victoria, sorry. Uh, well, look, that is the biggest problem we have. As you know that the lake has been dying from below 
since the 90s, actually. We discovered when I was working at the African Academy of Sciences, uh, when uh, together with ISIPE, uh, research was done uh, in, in conjunction with some Japanese university on the environmental degradation in Lake Victoria. And it was found that because the emission of affluence from upstream, for example, on the river Nzoya, uh, with pan pepper or kibuye, emitting tremendous affluence into the river Nzoya and the other sugar factories. Here in Kisumu, there was a matchbox factory just uh, not too far from the airport in the, on, in the industrial area there, which was really emitting tremendous affluence into the lake. Uh, and uh, on Kisat River, river upstream coming from Obunga into the lake, Kisat River has been one of the biggest uh, supplier of affluence into the lake. Okay. So over the years, not to mention the washing of cars in the, on the lake, over the years, uh, all this went and deposited itself at the bottom of the lake. And of course, you know, the weed called uh, hyacinth thrives on such an environment. And sooner rather than later, we had hyacinth on the lake, which complicated matters. At that point in time, hyacinth was just beginning. So the whole idea was to find out how we can... Uh, how we can uh, deal with hyacinth. And I'm telling you that uh, the CP came up with the idea, being an insect physiology institution, that is a beetle which could eat the hyacinth. Well, the beetle did do that, but the hyacinth was reproducing as a faster rate than the beetle could eat them. And very soon another inhabitant came called the hippograss, which grew on hyacinth, which was rot rotting from below too. So the lake has had a terrible problem. What are we doing? Well, at the moment, together with the Lake Basin Commission and uh, Lake Region uh, Development Board, or something like that, we, 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 we are mounting a program, not just for dealing with the hyacinth, but also for making sure that all these institutions emitting affluence into the, into the lake are stopped. First, I stopped the cleaning of cars on the lake completely, uh, which has helped. Secondly, with the opening of the, of the port, we've cleaned up all kinds of businesses that were near the port, that were near the water. Now, the next thing is to make sure that the other harbors, the other fish landing beaches around the lake, there's also some hygiene. Okay. Now, you realize that the lake part which has suffered most is the gulf the Nyanza Gulf, as it were, which is shared mainly by Kenya, Uganda, and part of Tanzania. Now, the Nyanza Gulf has suffered because somewhere on Bitter Causeway, when Bitter Causeway was built, it kind of stopped the Gulf from breathing. So Bitter Causeway has been removed partly, but some four courses of stones are still down there. The government has agreed to remove them. So we hope that once Bitter Causeway is completely cleared, the Gulf will breathe, and we'll have cleaner water in the lake, just as you have on the other side of the lake beyond the Mbita Causeway. One of your concerns sits in, in Kisumu, Bartholomew Okof Onyango is asking a question. I don't know whether you can see that on the screen. What's up with the health department? Things are moving along very badly. Otherwise, this has not been, ad been addressed, addressed here. I think it's going very badly in the health department there in Kisumu. Well, I don't think we have done very badly. In fact, if we had done badly, we would not have dealt with the coronavirus so effectively. I think what has happened in the health department, actually the health department in all counties in problems because of a uh, problem of revenue, a problem of uh, getting enough resources to run health. Even when I was in Minister for Medical Services, the health ministry was in trouble because People, Kenyan, Kenyan people want enough dispensaries, health centers, doctors, nurses. I mean, we have not done enough as a nation to develop adequate human resources for healthcare delivery, to develop requisite institutions for healthcare delivery. Now, health is a devolved function, but 83% but of health resources stay at the headquarters. Only 17 is here. Now, that's not very good in terms of... Uh, uh, giving uh, 
and uh, implementing the process of resources full of functions. So it's an institutional problem that all counties are trying to deal with. And of course, when salaries are late because uh, financial flows from the treasury are late, uh, although the salaries affect everybody, the health sectors are mostly affected because they're the people who work long hours, do the most difficult job. So I can understand when they go on strike, but then it is not a Kisumu County affair. It is a national problem, which we are trying to deal with, in, uh, as, as you know. Uh, I think better dialogue with the, with, with, with the health workers. We have initiated this, this dialogue at the national level. We had a, a COVID conference on Monday, attended by the president and the deputy president. And in that COVID conference, it was resolved that we must pay more attention to preventive and public health care, and particularly to our community health workers at grassroots. We must invest money in human resources development in health, and we must find resources to ensure that health workers are properly protected and properly remunerated. Now, this is a work in progress, and making a conclusive judgment, I think that our health system is, 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 is bonkers, I, I think it's a rather harsh judgment. I think we, we agree with our problems, we are dealing with them, but it's a national problem. It's a working progress, and I'm sure, I'm always an optimist, I'm sure that uh, we shall overcome these problems. Well, there is a question, and I think this is really clear. Uh, Isaiah Odak Onyango is saying single biggest hindrance is the 10% kickback mentality, and Kisumu is not spared. I think he's pretty much talking about corruption, and quite frankly, this is not uncommon. It's a common problem across, across Africa, and one of the reasons, uh, to be honest, was that uh, Africa and Kenya and Kisumu maybe is not doing very well is because corruption is as rampant as you can tell. So maybe further the, than what uh, Isaiah is saying, how are you dealing with corruption, and more specifically about that 10% kickback in Kisumu? Well, let me tell you something. Like in Luo, we say, blame the chicken, but also blame the wild cat. You tell the chicken, why did you go to the river? When you know the wild cat is there. Then you tell the wild cat, why did you have to go to the river when the chicken is coming to get water? I mean, so, so you can blame the chicken and the wild cat at the same time. In other words, bribery and corruption takes two to katango. If, if people are prepared to give bribes, they will be takers. If you are prepared to, to avoid the procedure, that everybody follows so that yours can be done faster. There will be, there will be uh, people to bribe. If people are being hired at a public service board, county public service board, with very clear rules, but you think that if you take money there, your, your, your son or your relative will be considered especially, there will be corruption. So I think what, what we need to do is realize that corruption is not just government by itself, but society in general. It's a fight that is a, it's a moral fight. It's a fight that uh, requires cultural change. It requires exemplary leadership. So the leaders themselves demonstrate to the public that, that fighting corruption is worth it. That you can occupy a, part, a position like I occupy now without necessarily self-enriching yourself. I mean, I have been in parliament since uh, 1993. And look, Everything that I've gotten, I've gotten because I was a member of the parliamentary uh, what, circle, two of them, Bunge circle and parliamentary circle, and, and they give good terms in terms of uh, loans and so on, where you can use and do your thing. What do you need in this life? I mean, if you can get some money and, and buy an apartment or, or buy a farm and, and, and use it well for, for, for looking after your family, you only have about not more than to four or so decades in this world, or, 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 or eight decades, whatever. Use it well. I mean, why do you have to deprive others of, of, of resources just because you want it yourself? I think the mentality that, uh, that, that needs to change, really, especially for those of us in, in, in public positions, that, uh, you know, just amassing, amassing more wealth and, 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 and tolerating corruption is not going to help because even you yourself, it is not going to help. I was seen in this country, for example, people have a lot of wealth who die and then their families cannot have access to that wealth because of conflicts, what not, laws, I don't know what. So when these things are before our eyes, the public itself should, should fight against corruption honestly, not just by word, and, 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 and stop practicing corruption themselves. I mean, if you are there, in, 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 in the marketplace, 
You go there and you know you should pay your rate or your license and do something, but you prepared bribing somebody at the gate so that you pay less. You are not being very useful to us. And I'm sorry, in this city, I have seen that even today, things were reported to me where the people needing services are the ones who are in the forefront of encouraging corruption. It doesn't help. Uh, Professor, and for our viewers, please, those ones who are watching, please keep posting your questions there. We're about to finish, and the professor will still have time to answer those questions. So here's a question for you, Professor. You, you, you've been a member of parliament. You've been a distinguished professor. You've been a governor. So what, what title will you have in 2023? Is it a Governor Nyong'o or President Nyong'o? No, of course, really. President Nyong'o, you're dreaming, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something that you just wake up and become. It's not possible, my brother. <laughs> I mean, yes, I will be a second term governor, that I'm sure of, because there are certain things I have to do. But after finishing my second term, God willing, I go back to the university. I mean, enough of public life. I mean, what more? I know I can't be president, that's for sure. So what more do you want me to aim at? I mean, I would have done my best by the time I finished my second term. I would have seen my my flagship project finished, I would look back and say, yeah, this is the Kisumu that I'd wanted in 1993 when we held the Kisumu We Want Convention here, supported by the uh, by a German Foundation, you know. Uh, so I think that the way we are going, I think doing a second term is the best I can do in my life in the public sphere. Okay. Oh. Well said. So, Professor, uh, as we finish, I'm going to get off the screen and I'll give, give you a, one, a chance to talk to the people in diaspora. There are many Kenyans and friends of Kenya who are watching you right, right, now, right now across America, around the world. So here's a chance for you to talk to them directly. Well, I, I'd really like to appeal to my brothers and sisters in diaspora, particularly in North America, where I went to graduate school, uh, that we appreciate you. But, but where you are in the U.S. as Kenyans, as Africans, Please join the struggle for the liberation of black people in the U.S. Uh, when I was in graduate school, we joined the uh, Chicago Committee for the Liberation of Angola, Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, because those were still under colonial rule. But I also attended the Center for Inner City Studies in Chicago, where people being taught black civilization and joining the South Side struggles among black people for rent, for racial, disc anti-racial discrimination and all that. I think we should ad identify with our people wherever we are. Don't keep yourself just as Kenyans. You know that there are black people in the U.S. who are going through tremendous problems and they need support from their brothers and sisters from the continent. So the more you identify with the black people's struggle, however difficult it is, I think the better for us even in the continent. We know that we have ambassadors in the U.S who are uh, living to the principles of Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Tom Boyer, Jaramogi Oginga Dinga, and most of all, Patrice Lumumba and Nelson Mandela. I think thank you very much, uh, Professor Dad said. I think uh, it's time we'll come to the end of the conversation. I want to thank you very, very kindly for doing this for us, and I hope that uh, the rest of Kenya, and I want to make this very clear for our viewers watching in Kenya and here in the, in the United States. We at KDL TV, politically, we are fearlessly independent, so we welcome all views, whether those ones in the, in, in the government or opposition, we welcome, and those ones in the community as well, we welcome you so that we can have a good conversation and connecting well with the diaspora. But first, I want to thank... Your team there in Kisumu, uh, Professor G uh, Governor Nyongo, I want to thank your PA guy, uh, Dr. Orwa. You've been ex extremely good to us. You, we tried to work this over the last two weeks to make sure that this worked. We want to thank you very kindly for doing that for us. We also want to thank the IT guy in your office as well, Nick Misot. You, you really did a great job for us. And uh, for the press guy, Agol, we thank you very, very kindly for doing the, this for us. Agel, I pronounce that well. Agel, thank you. Thank you, Agel, for doing this Agel. for us. <laughs> Is it Agal? I apologize, Agal. If that Agal. Was different. So, Agal, mm -hmm. I'll call you after. So, thank you for doing this for us, and I hope we can we'll continue having good partnership for the sake of our people. Yeah. I, I can't thank enough 
last but not least, the chief of protocol in your office, Bob Madanji. Madanji has been absolutely gracious to us. He's really worked around the clock to make sure that we have this life. So we want to thank him on the hair. Thank you for, for doing that, that for us. And more importantly, thank you for what you're doing for the people of Kisumu and the people of Kenya. I hope we'll continue this conversation so that we can partner in making sure that we're okay uh, as, as we grow as, as a population. So on behalf of the crew here on KDL TV, I want to ask you, the viewers, wherever you are watching us live, Please go to Facebook, subscribe to us. That's the best way we can grow. And then go to YouTube, follow us, and subscribe. Facebook, like us, and comment. Post your questions. We'll forward those questions to the good governor in Kisumu. Hopefully, we can get back to you at some point. And also, I'm reminded to remind you that we are on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter and make your comments. We'll be happy to do that. So I want to welcome you again, our viewers, on Sunday at 10 Central Time here in the United States, which should be 6 Kenyan Time. We're going to move to the government side, and we're going to have Walter Nyambane, also known as Ridiculous. He will be joining us live. He's already here in the U.S. I think he's in New York. He'll be in Minneapolis in a few days. He will be here talking to us about what they in government are doing to make sure that the youth in Kenya are part of the bigger cake and the bigger conversation. So we'll have that. And then shortly after that, at 11 Central Time, which should be Kenyan Time, 7, uh, Kenyan, Kenyan Time, 7 p.m., we're going to have to dissect the political environment here in the United States. And so we're honored to have some of the leading uh, professors here in the U.S. will be joined live here with uh, uh, Charlie White, a CEO of the uh, CL Enterprises here in Minneapolis. We'll also be joined with uh, Pro Professor Masibo Lumala from uh, University of Purdue in Indiana. He will be here to uh, enjoy a conversation with us. Also, we have uh, Professor Wanjala Nasongo, who is down in Lauders, Tennessee, in Memphis, Tennessee. We'll be talking about the politics here in the United States. So, so uh, instead of watching the CNN, we're having some of, of our best minds and political analysts who will come here and talk about the political crime here in the United States. So we hope you join us on Sunday. Thank you so much for being on, and we hope to continue this conversation in the in days ahead. But to you again, Professor Anyang Yonga there in Kisumu, thank you so much for being with us for now. Thank you. Good evening in Kenya, and have a nice day here in the United States.